Few Nexus Module 6, Progress in Food Production, Part 2. Whether it was drought in arid desert regions or winter freezing water into ice, the limits to plant growth and reproduction, and hence to animal fecundity, were set by the availability of water. In the Middle East, certainly, it was not energy that was missing from the Nexus. Sunshine has always been abundant in those latitudes to provide energy for food production. In the European countries, the harsh winters did indeed constrain plant productivity, and famines could result in winter if care wasn't taken to take the enormous fecundity of the spring, summer, and fall and store the harvest surplus for the fallow period. But hunter-gatherers north and south in the cold regions or the hot ones originally depended on agroforestry, on tree crops, on perennials, not annuals. And they depended on the animals that depended on forests, on forest boars and jungle fowl and woodland ungulates, all the ancestors of our modern pigs and chickens and cows. In the north, the forest leaf fall in the fall built up incredible rich soils during the winter ready for an explosion of food in the spring and summer, which created enough surplus for the mammals we ate to survive the winter. In the south, the forests retained the water that fell sporadically and created their own microclimates through transpiration. The forests that they created created environments so rich in the cornucopia of foodstuffs that our mythology now recalls them as the Garden of Eden. And if you want some mythological proof of the disaster of agriculture, just look at the curse we were to endure after eating the tree of knowledge and getting kicked out of the garden. To Adam, God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. That's uh, me trying to do Eddie Izzard doing James Mason playing God. It's an in-joke, so if you don't know Eddie Izzard, never mind. I suppose I could have read it in the Morgan Freeman voice. It's worth repeating. Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground. So that would be me doing... <laughs> Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman, who is God. But anyway, eating bread is not the salvation according to ancient scripture. Eating bread is the curse. So no wonder so many hunters and gatherers said, well shoot, I'm going back into the forest. No way I'm doing hard time through painful toil to eat when I can pick fruits and vegetables and trap animals. And the fossil evidence of malnutrition affecting the pelvic bones of women, noted by Spencer Wells in Pandora's Seed, is corroborated in the curse in Genesis when God says, to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. We can even comment on what this reveals about the emergence of patriarchal rule due to the shift to grain agriculture. My experience with hunter-gatherer populations is that the women are usually the ones who understood the sheer abundance of biodiversity that nature offered to put into the cooking pot. I experienced it when I was living with Malayu and Dayak tribes in the rainforests of Borneo and was taken into the forest by the medicine woman who was cooking our meal and her grandson who climbed the trees to get the foods. She was called the witch doctor, and as she laid out the huge variety of foods we collected to put in the cooking pot, I had image of the witch's cauldron with its eyes of newt, frog's legs, bat's wings, all things that would have provided great, inexpensive, abundant protein but which today are shamefully associated with evil and witchcraft. After all, women were burned at the stake for understanding and promoting biodiversity and diet by the European patriarchy, and children punished or mocked for thinking they could go into the forest as kids do and come back munching on lizards and grubs. Agriculture can be blamed not only for this tremendous patriarchal violence and loss of biodiversity, 
as we simplified the landscape to a handful of weedy grasses, but for what James Scott calls the dumbification of humanity. At one time, as I experienced among the hunters and gatherers of Borneo, harvesting food was an educational adventure that made women and children experts who rivaled the best PhD botanists and naturalists who Harvard sent out. With agriculture, we turned brilliant, self-sufficient peasants into outdoor factory workers. And of course, quite literally, when you're talking about the first 400 years of agriculture in the European colonized Americas, slaves. The violence inherent in agriculture rears its ugly head everywhere. And it could be said that Genesis itself records the clearest indication that grain agriculture is the scourge of mankind, the source of its original sin of violence, in the story of Cain and Abel. This chapter of the Bible is the clearest indictment of wheat agriculture one could imagine, and nobody seems to comment on it. Abel is a pastoralist who tends a flock of animals who wander about like ungulate hunter-gatherers, eating what God has given them. His brother Cain is, well, a wheat farmer, somehow stupidly living out God's curse to scratch a living in the hot sun through toil amidst the thistles and thorns that always accompany weed agriculture. Abel brings a lamb meat sacrifice to the altar of God, along with diverse fruits and vegetables he has gathered, and God is pleased. Cain then comes with a bunch of wheat, and the Bible says, But for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. To me, this is a clear indication that the ancients saw wheat offerings as a kind of sin, the sin of an addiction, an addiction which Cain could not master. In his anger, he turns around and kills his gentle, carnivorous, animal-slaughtering brother. Now think about it for a minute. It's enough to make vegans go mad. The vegetarian is the killer. The slaughter of baby goats is the gentle one. Could it be that this ancient myth, that these ancient myths were there to warn us that wheat is a weed, that grains are drugs, that we haven't been growing food all along, but addictive substances that will end up mastering us through the botany of desire? So to get back to Reverend Malthus, who, in my opinion, must not have spent an awful lot of time delving into the hermeneutic interpretation of the books he preached in his fiery diatribes against the poor and the immigrants, it is clear to me that the entire Malthusian premise is based on a fabrication of the weed eaters, who most likely did observe that if they kept planting grains and consuming starches and sugars, their own sickly but ever-increasing population would outstrip the fecundity of the land and so human populations would increase geometrically, while their drug food agriculture would only increase arithmetically, if at all. But if Abel had been able, we might have returned to the garden a long, long time ago, where food is a self-increasing population grown in permacultural symbiosis into perpetuity. The good news is that the world as we know it is coming to an end. And what is ending isn't the good life, but the bad life, the curse that we inherited from our dumbified forebears, we can begin again. Permacultural food production shows us how.